When you try new health trends, do you end up more frustrated than fulfilled? Are you left feeling confused on your well-being journey? If these questions hit home, you are not alone. Today, I have an expert on this question. I am thrilled to welcome Tony Wrighton, a former Sky Sports broadcaster, NLP expert, and a host of the Stology podcast. Tony shares ways to revitalize your health, enhance your mental clarity, and find more joy in your everyday life. Enjoy the show. Tony, I am delighted to invite you today on the Charlene Giselle show. It is so exciting to have you as a guest after being uh, the very honored guest onto your podcast. Tony, a warm, warm welcome. Yeah, you were. It was great to have you on mine. And yeah, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> well, Tony, one of the many topics that you've become an expert in is one that I'm really fascinated about. And it's that really, how do we boost our energy? How can we alleviate all of this anxiety? And one thing that I love about your approach is that you've merged the art of combining NLP, one of my passion with biohacking, another one of my passion. <laughs> so perhaps can we start there for our audience that may or may not be familiar with NLP biohacking? Can you tell us a bit about that in your experience and how you've merged the two? Yeah, they always say it's good to have a niche. And I've got Ooh. two real niches, which means I'm in basically in a niche of one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but NLP is neuro linguistic programming, and you know some of your audience might be familiar with it. But essentially, it's a study of how we do things well, how we communicate with ourselves and with other people. And the bit that I love is the bit how we communicate with ourselves, because often that is a massive difference in terms of our overall well being and happiness and health. And then I have looked quite a lot at health over the years as well. I've had a, a podcast based on health and biohacking because I got really ill myself almost 10 years ago. I went to the jungle, got a virus, spent months in bed. And eventually, once I got back to full health, it felt a very natural fit to examine exactly why I got ill. And, and part of it was the fact that my mindset just wasn't totally on point. I've always been someone who tends towards anxiety, as many people do in the sort of burnout world. And if you can get your headspace right, it can help you heal, which is actually a really difficult concept for people to get their heads around because it almost feels like a bit of an insult. You know, mm -hmm. you're sort of saying, well, are you trying to tell me that these symptoms are linked to what I'm thinking about? And mm -hmm. the difficult answer is yes. Did you realize that overnight while in the jungle? Oh, it took a long time, Shalene. <laughs> yeah, I, I came home and ended up, I was working full-time as a TV presenter at that point. I'm not full-time anymore, but I was working at Sky as a Sky Sports presenter and ended up spending three months in bed, went to multiple neurologists and immunologists and e experts from all different sort of medical areas. And all of them said, we know you've had a virus But there are a lot of viruses in the world, and some of them, especially in tropical areas, haven't really even been mapped out. And you're, you're suffering from some sort of post-viral symptoms. And I'm a very type A person. I mean, you work with a lot of type A people, don't you? <laughs> and my instinct was to furiously Google for 15 hours a day until I found the solution. And actually, what I needed to do was the exact opposite. And I know you look at burnout a lot, and this is just one of the things that's really hard for people. Acceptance and letting your body just relax and get into a healing state is often the most counterintuitive thing, but the thing that we need the most. Would you say that it was a burnout episode? Oh, yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. When I look at my life beforehand, how I was living, not just work, work and play, and just everything. Work hard, play harder, kind of work lifestyle. hard, play harder. Definitely tend towards being a type A overstimulated sort, quite highly anxious. Don't want to think of myself as anxious, but I am. And it was the catalyst for, for changing almost everything. And before then, I'd sort of learned a lot of these NLP skills. And I'd never really thought about it in relation to health. Mm -hmm. And as a result of what happened with this burnout episode, yeah, then I had to reappraise everything I knew about mindset. 
And if you go back in time, so perhaps before the awareness piece, before you ever knew that you were about to navigate this burnout episode, what do you think could have been the telltale sign that perhaps you ignored at the time, but now with the power of insight, you can go back and think, oh, those were warning signs or those were red flags, but I ignored them? Mm. Because you've been through similar sorts of things. Am I right in saying that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really good question because, of course, if you could if you could stop it happening, <laughs> you know that'd be lovely, wouldn't it? Um, I guess I at the root of it for me is a sort of a low level anxiety which I see in so many people that I work in, I work with, and so many people in the sort of biohacking world as well as well as so many people in the corporate world, you know, that real sort of type A anxiety that helps you to get ahead can be uh, also the thing that makes you feel the most miserable and eventually gets the most ill. And when I was to look at, if I was to look at telltale signs, I guess when you're in your 20s and 30s, you can get away with a lot, can't you? But pushing my body to the absolute limit, powering on through, um, suffering quite severe cases of anxiety and not really doing much about it. And at a deeper level, some unresolved addiction and trauma issues, which were to come out in the subsequent years, which needed dealing with and just hadn't been dealt with. You know, and, and actually, that's the sort of thing where I, there were no, the, the telltale signs might have been there, but I wasn't sophisticated enough to see them. But the unresolved trauma and addiction issues were definitely there. Mm. But that's part of the coping mechanism, isn't it? Sort of yeah. keep at it, push harder, push beyond the boundaries, ignore the sign, keep working, do more, busy, busy, busy. <laughs> yeah. And when it's really serious addiction, the NLP and mindset techniques that I teach can help. And they can help just in terms of raising an awareness as to what the problems is. But sometimes you need a little bit more. And for me, I found a really good psychotherapist as well to help mm -hmm. deal with the addiction stuff. And that was that was priceless. You know, without that, I really, I couldn't have quite navigated a recovery. And what are the common addictions that you see most often in your clientele now in the corporate world? People that come to you, they want to learn your method. You have extraordinary tools in your toolkit. What do you see people struggle with most often? Well, I would be really interested to know your opinion on this because there is some debate over whether phone addiction is a real addiction, to which I've I've asked a lot of experts and the ones that I respect say yes. But to me, it's an overstimulation. It's always being switched on. You know, I spoke to a client a couple of days ago and I said, what's your working day like? And he said, well, I tend to do around 10 hours a day as a start but then that's not allowing for the fact I'm contactable in the morning before I start work and in the evening once I get home. And I sort of thought, I guess it's a sign of how far I've come, but I thought if I was to do 10 hours straight sitting down and then be contactable in the evening, I would now get ill very quickly because I just can't handle that sort of thing. You know, I, I sort of think that it's, it's an ever-increasing affliction of being overstimulated, hyper vigilant, and constantly switched on. And I don't think we have the skills to let go. And what do you find are some of the most powerful skills or tools to help in the journey of starting to let go? Yeah, well, I, I love an Australian doctor called uh, Dr. Claire Weeks, mm. who was a very famous a uh, woman who, uh, before, way before she was a doctor, she was diagnosed with tuberculosis by her doctor in Sydney and basically spent the next nine months thinking she was going to die. And nine months later, she went to a second doctor who said, uh, sorry, your first doctor got it wrong. You don't have tuberculosis, <laughs> which felt like a massive reprieve. And that was a very formative experience that allowed her to then say, OK, I'm going to go on. I'm going to become a, a medical doctor, but I'm going to specialize in anxiety and the mental approach to dealing with ill health. And she wrote this book called Self-Help for Your Nerves, which is sort of now quite old-fashioned, you might say, but it really is 
so, so helpful for anyone sort of going through this state of hypersensitivity, overstimulation. What she talks is about acceptance and floating through this anxiety when you're feeling anxiety when you're sort of hyper hyper stimulated she talks about how to sort of let go and her approach is brilliant and that's something that i've incorporated into my courses into my work a lot because almost everybody seems to say oh i love that i love that floating technique that you teach hmm Floating technique. When I hear floating, I think about sensory deprivation and floating tank. That's really where my mind is going. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Have you have you done that? Yes, I love that. I really do. I found it do at you? first quite intimidating because I had to use NLP actually to help me with one of my claustrophobia. I was very, very claustrophobic before I got coached through NLP. And I have to confess that when I was in the tank for the very first time, I did have to really go back to the drawing board and use all the tools that I learned. Yeah. Because I could feel, I could feel the anxiety knocking at the door. You know, I could feel that moment where you go, yeah. right, you have a choice here. You can go back to the pattern that you used to know, <laughs> mm. or you can use all the new tools that you've acquired. Which one is it going to be? <laughs> Um, and yeah. I actually found that working through it and reframing my mind and going back, you know, through the breath and picturing colors as well, because obviously you can't see, but I really use this idea of picturing and noticing the sensation of comfort and warmth and telling myself that I was safe and using, using positive affirmation really went back a long way. And then I work through that trigger up until the point I felt neutral. I could go into the tank and feel neutral. And I knew, okay, that's actually really helped me close that chapter of my life in terms of working through my phobia. Wow. That's why I always like hanging out with you, Shalom, because actually I can tell you are a very driven person who gets a lot done in life, like me. And a lot of those sorts of people actually tend towards some some sort of habits like that sort of anxiety that actually can be quite counterproductive and what you've done is you've worked through that without losing any of that drive so when you get into a tank and you start to think oh i'm having a bit of a panic here you really work i mean i'm exactly that sort of personality as well i'm sort of fiddling with the earbuds and i'm tr struggling to get comfortable and i'm like oh where do i put my neck and oh my god i can't <laughs> see and where's the lid of the tank i'm gonna get salt in my <laughs> eyes and it's a struggle <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that's why I love working with people on stuff around, you know, health and mindset, because I know I need it all the time. It's a, it's a process. It's a continuous process that's still going on all the time for me. Oh, absolutely. And I think really in many ways you need to have been there to A, sympathize and empathize, but also continue to go through the journey, right? To have this thirst of learning and acquiring new tools and techniques. One of the things that I really found insightful about your approach to health is the fact that you really masterfully found the sweet spot between highlighting the technology aspect, so the tracking and the biohacking world, but also bringing it back to the fundamentals. So I personally really thoroughly enjoyed the chapter of your book relating to nature, to exercise, to cool, to the mind, to the fuel, to home, to sleep, because as much as we can be tempted, and as a biohacker, I include myself very much, and I put my hands up and can mm. be guilty of that, to go for the shiny objects syndrome right like the new gadget yeah, the new toy yeah. the new thing that is cool that comes out of the cynical valley and you want to be part of the aura ring club and the everything club and i love those tools and i have them but i think yeah. sometimes it's going back to the basics right and not bypassing the essential can you talk to us a little bit about how fundamentals are the fundamentals yeah i mean it's it's funny because the fundamentals in terms of uh health wellness mindset biohacking are nearly always the most boring things it's basically go to bed on time get enough sleep get up fairly reasonable time in the morning and get outside and that's quite boring compared to a ring that gives you your temperature and your heart rate variability and what you should buy for tea next tuesday <laughs> um i mean my my journey with cold exposure for example is a perfect 
is a perfect metaphor for the simple things in life being potentially the most powerful. Because when I first got into biohacking, I discovered this thing called cryotherapy. I don't mm, know. Have you done that? Of Shall course. I? Yes. Yeah. I've actually done it yeah. here in London. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. It's fun in London. Uh, London cryo is a great place yes. to go for it. Um, and, um, you know, you essentially, you get into a tank and it cools your body down to minus 230 Fahrenheit for three minutes, which is so cold. Your body feels like it's every cell in your body thinks I'm dying here. So I'm going to, to produce massive amounts of extra energy to keep this person alive and actually you get this huge sense of uh, rejuvenation. And then on a deeper cellular level, you're getting lots of sort of cell recovery and cell regeneration going on as well. And I always found for me that is a bit much, actually. It's too, it, it was just too much for my body to handle. It's too much of a stressor on the body. Mm, interesting. And so have you gone back to your regular cold bath or cold showers instead? Well, then I tried cold uh, ice baths. And again, just would get out and just feel so, so good. Wonderfully rejuvenated. But later on in the day and the next day, I feel quite tired. And so now I've just ended up going in the sea, which is completely free, totally natural, not as cold. And suits me perfectly. And that's the evolution of my journey as a biohacker from something which costs quite a lot of money, three minutes in a cryotherapy chamber, which is to something which is absolutely free, which is going down to the sea, especially now I live here in Portugal, where the sea's not quite as cold, and uh, having a little morning dip, which I did this morning, Charlene. Mm. So could you walk us through your non-negotiables, your habits, the ones that are really part of your new you? <laughs> my non-negotiables, I guess... The two things that are really important to me are exercise and meditation. And over the years, I've become aware through my obsessive tracking of metrics that exercise is something that really helps me to feel better. In fact, I track my energy levels daily. I give myself a score out of 10 and then I see what else I've done and what improves my energy levels. And I found when I work out, my energy level increases by over 5%. Therefore, exercise is a non-negotiable. So when you say you track it, I'm really curious here. Do you mean you track it by using a method, a spreadsheet? How exactly do you track it? Well, I started off with a pen and paper, did that for years. Uh, then I graduated to uh, various apps. I think there's one called Simple. There's my, fit my Fitness Pal. There's Symptom Tracker app. Um, there's quite a few different apps you can use. I now use a Google spreadsheet, a Google form actually that links through to a Google sheet. And it takes about a minute and a half to fill out every evening. And I just ask myself a serious a series of questions like, what was my energy out of 10? What was my sleep like last night? Uh, do I feel inflamed? Are there any notes that I need to put in? Did I take certain supplements? And then occasionally I crunch all the numbers and come up with the stats. And I have to tell you, Charlene, Chat GPT is fantastic for <laughs> analyzing the data here. You can just take a screen grab of your data, put it into Chat GPT, and it'll give you all the information you ever want. And sometimes it'll even get it right. Sometimes it doesn't get it right, and that's a real problem. But, um, but before that, I used to actually pay someone to analyze my data for me. And it turns out that when I work out, my energy levels uh, are, on average, about 5.2% higher. And meditation as well, it's... It's, I mean, I say it's non-negotiable occasionally with the demands of modern life and parenting. There just isn't the time. But generally speaking, I've got time to meditate. If I can rope in my four-year-old son to do it, I'll get him to do it as well. He's, he's sometimes a bit reluctant, but sometimes I can make it quite fun for him and he'll get involved too. And that, that is also something that always just makes me feel better. Mm. How do you keep up that consistency? Do you schedule things? Do you have an accountability partner? What are the key measures here to make sure that you keep that up? Well, um, you may know this already, Charlene, but I always encourage people to get some sort of accountability partner. Or if I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, I am their accountability partner. And I ask them to either message me every night if there's something I want them to do specifically or we'll have a WhatsApp group, a separate WhatsApp group, 
dedicated to that thing that is a non-negotiable. So mm. me and my wife have two WhatsApp groups. One is for meditation and one is for workout. And every day we put in how long we've worked out for and how, and how long we've meditated. And if I don't meditate, my wife knows about it, but also it's just that it's there. I can see, oh no, I've forgotten to meditate for the last three days. It gives me the kick up the backside that I need to actually go and do it today. There's also a deep sense of satisfaction when you get to, you know, write a decent score in the box. So today I've I've already been for a swim in the sea. I'll count that as about 10 minutes exercise. And then a Pilates class, that's 60 minutes. So I can put 70 in my WhatsApp group today for my exercise WhatsApp. And I'm, I'm feeling I'm going to beat my wife today. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens is, say, tomorrow you don't meet your goal or she doesn't reach her goal. What, what's, what kind of... Uh, punishment or reward is that for <laughs> i want to know that <laughs> I, I guess the only jeopardy is that i am an extremely competitive person and I so is see. she therefore i'm Ooh. competing against myself and i'm competing against her and the satisfying thing is we've been doing the meditation whatsapp group since 2018 i think and we've been doing the whatsapp groups the workout group since about 2020 so you can go back every month and see, well, did I work out more than last month or more than this month last year? It's quite satisfying to be able to see your progress. And there's no doubt that over the years, it's encouraged me to work out a lot more than I used to. And how much do you think this working out and meditation and doing it jointly with your wife and being accountable to her and her being accountable to you play a huge part in cultivating a healthy marriage <laughs> um i don't think it makes much difference in creating a healthy relationship or marriage but what i would say is that it helps us to be at our best which we've both found to be extremely important in cultivating a healthy marriage and i guess the only other thing to say on that is that we prioritize so much our own time which I, I, I sometimes feel not all parents do, but we will always say to each other, you, you haven't had a workout today and you've been, you've been busy. And it's uh, so rather than an hour of parenting here, you go off to the gym, sort yourself out, come back in an hour. And of course you go to the gym and you come back an hour later and you feel great and you're ready to do the parenting and the relationship stuff that perhaps an hour beforehand you were feeling a little bit sluggish on. Mm, of course. And Tony, I'm really curious because I know you work with a lot of high achievers, a lot of type A personalities. How do you work around the perhaps most common objection, which is, well, I love your method, Tony. I buy into the meditation. I buy into the nature exposure. I buy into the sleep. I buy into the workout, but I don't have time. <sighs> yeah, that's that's really interesting. The, the, the other, I, I thought you were going to say with, with the common objections, I think the other thing is that sometimes when people aren't in the state of health that they want to be in, I think often it's actually a bit of a struggle persuading people that they need to work on what's going on up here rather than ah. take a supplement or go and see the doctor. That's, that, that is another common objection that's hard. There's no real way around it. If, they don't, if they're not ready for it, they're not ready for it. But it's, it's hugely important and it is borne out by stacks of research i mean they think that oh i think i saw at tim biohackers post today on instagram saying that up to 60 percent of all doctor's visits are related to stress well that mm -hmm. is literally what's going in, on in your head and your lifestyle affecting your physical health if there wasn't enough reason to sort of make changes in that area then i don't know what is but anyway going back to the other objection what was the other objection again time oh time yeah i guess one of the things that I really love with NLP is a technique known as limiting beliefs, um, which you will know because you've done your you've done your NLP training multiple times. <laughs> I know you have. But limiting beliefs is something that I so often do with clients because ultimately it's figuring out your priorities in life. And it involves uh, a sort of a pyramid of different areas which i call a mind pyramid and at the bottom it's all the stuff that goes on day to day like environment and behavior so where you spend your time what you do with your time and then you have capabilities so how good are you at doing those things that you're doing with your time but then at the top of the pyramid you've got all the really important things in life 
like identity and values and beliefs. And I would ask people who are struggling with time management or don't feel like they've got enough time but do want to make changes, I would say, what's really important to you in your life? And it's nearly always the same sort of things. They they want to be around and present with the people that they love. They want to provide for them. They want to make a difference. They want to have a purpose. They want to act with meaning in the world. And all of those things at an environment and behavior level mean you have to work hard, but you have to look after yourself because if you're feeling crap, you're not going to be able to do all those things that are really important to you at the top of the pyramid. And we we show that the, the values and beliefs are linked to the behavior. If it's an important value of yours to be present for your family, then if your behavior is that you're working a 12-hour day, shutting your laptop and immediately expecting to be at your best with your kids, that's going to be a real struggle. Mm. And therefore, we see that everything is linked in that logical levels pyramid. Absolutely. So if we were to look at or analyze your value system and your beliefs, and if we were to walk all the way back to... Tony, the broadcaster, working really, really, really hard and perhaps not quite prioritizing mm. your mind, your health, your lifestyle. And Tony now living in Portugal, having an accountability WhatsApp group with his wife. Have your core <laughs> values changed or have your belief system changed? Or is it that now your behaviors are more aligned with core values that you always had but didn't embody before? At an identity level, I haven't changed. At a values and beliefs level, I probably have because it's 10 years on. I've got a wife and family now and I didn't before. As I said, the sort of addiction was playing havoc with my behavior at a lower level, but probably with some of my values as well. Um, and ultimately, you know, when I've done this exercise myself, I've, I've loved it actually thinking about it from a professional and a personal point of view. And I, at an identity level, very much feel like I'm a communicator. You know, I've been a professional communicator as a radio and TV presenter for 30 years. I now do this sort of thing. I write books and podcasts and everything else. And communicating with other people personally and professionally is, I feel, what I'm best at. Um, so I've sort of really enjoyed that. And then everything trickles down from there. But that is a good question. I, I'd sort of love to ask the same. And also, I'd love to know with you how you marry the demands of being uh, very successful with what you do and traveling a lot with work, which can be pretty exhausting, I know. And also, from a biohacking perspective and a values perspective, giving enough time to sort of rest and relax and be yourself and enjoy life. Yeah, well, I was smiling when you talked about communication because that made me reflect on core values that have remained identical when I think of me as a lawyer over a decade ago and me now as mm. a keynote speaker and a coach. The biggest thing that hasn't changed is the fundamental core value of wanting to advocate, of wanting to serve, because advocacy and wanting to serve and wanting to help or really just finding solution is at the core of being a lawyer and it is also at the mm. core of being a coach and being a keynote speaker. Mm. The biggest thing that has changed for me is that I had no awareness of health. My playing field was actually just excellence and success. They've always driven me as core values. And I was very much brought up in a family where success was rewarded. Being top of the school was rewarded and encouraged. Mm. Sports, not so much. Uh, it was always about intellectual achievement. And that was what I wanted to excel at. So it was only when I was faced with the absence of health that I realized there was the existence of wanting to have health. So if I'm being very blunt, it's through seeing my father nearly die in front of me when he had a stroke before my eyes that I realized that the opposite of life 
was death. You know, it took sort of almost mm. seeing someone so close to me go through burnout and nearly lose his life over it to think, oh, right. So there is something to be said about longevity and about wanting to actually enjoy your success and wanting to survive your success because otherwise what's what's the point? So I became interested in the topic of well-being and longevity and biohacking and sustainability as a result of my own health deterioration. Mm. Yeah. And the world of the worlds of lawyer, the old legal legal world and the TV world, I guess there are a lot of similarities. You know, mm. it's it's a very fast paced, driven, unhealthy world in TV. You work in a room with no windows and a lot of bright night lights, and you're often working until midnight, eating some absolute crap that you got from the canteen and shoveling it down because you're on air in five minutes flat. It's the adrenaline keeps you going, which is exactly the same as the legal world. And in that sense, I guess there are a lot of similarities. Wow. That indoor lifestyle, right? It may not be an office. It may be a studio in your case, but it's still that natural light deprivation and lack of windows and fresh air. Mm. What about the sedentary lifestyle as well? Because I assume just like lawyers, you would be effectively not moving a lot right in in that profession i think so i mean the the great thing about being a tv presenter is it's intense but the hours aren't particularly long <laughs> um <laughs> but i have found that uh since stepping away from doing that full time and working more on being an author i have much more control over my time now in terms of being able to move around the difficult thing is that i've tried you, know, you talk about moving around a lot and the sedentary lifestyle. I've tried so much to be less sedentary in terms of how I work. And I've tried to do more work on the treadmill. And Charlene, it just doesn't work. <laughs> it's just, I'm like juggling, I'm juggling my phone and trying to make notes and I'm getting knackered. And it, it just, it, there's something about sitting down or even if you've got a standing desk standing up that seems to work a lot better. And I can't quite figure out how to be an author and walk about all day. But if I could, I would be delighted. <laughs> Is that your next step? <laughs> That's the next step. They do make these walking treadmills, don't they? So maybe I need to try the, the walking treadmill with a little desk that slots in on top. So maybe I need to try that and, and see what happens. Tony, one of the things that I would love to explore with you is around your expertise with histamine. Perhaps can you give us a little bit of an understanding of what histamine can look like and feel like in terms of symptoms that people may not know and what are the things that are most helpful? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess my recovery was two pronged in that firstly, I realized I needed to stop living such an over adrenalized lifestyle. And then secondly, there was something more going on under the hood. And that was gut problems that would persistently flare up without much warning. And the last thing on my list to investigate, all the other things I'd tried, but the thing that was most confusing, therefore it was at the bottom of the list, was histamine intolerance. And I started trying a histamine, a low histamine diet, and I started to feel better within a few hours. It was so liberating, cutting out just a few high histamine foods. And something that I'd sort of never really been aware of before, and some of your listeners and viewers might not be aware of either, made a massive difference to me. And in your experience, do you think there are a lot of people that walk through life without knowing they may suffer from this histamine issue? I think so, because with my journalist hat on, I then started the histamine intolerance site and an Instagram and just started sharing my experience of navigating this world. And I've been amazed at how many people have got in touch with me saying, oh my God, I've suffered with this for years. I, I feel like I've never really had much help or people haven't got it. I mean, I know that I've had histamine intolerance before the term was even in existence. Therefore, there's a lot of other people out there who've been suffering with this as well. And, um, oh, it's really, it's just fantastic once you start getting into it. The problem is you do have to sort of give up dark chocolate, Charlene. So I don't mm -hmm. know that everyone's ready for that step. <laughs> give up, give up. Like there isn't a little, just it's a complete, uh, no, no. Well, you know, chocolate, red wine, avocados, fermented foods, leftovers, these things are unfortunately high in histamine, but it's not forever. It's just while you get yourself back on track. And what are the things that we've talked about, the things we can remove? What are the things that you can add to actually help with histamine intolerance? 
Yeah, well, there are some things that are actually good for histamine intolerance. Um, pea shoots are the best thing. <laughs> um, so if you've been suffering from these unexplained uh, gut issues, skin issues, maybe migraines, headaches, you've got, I don't know, IBS or cramps or hormonal issues, you just might want to look at a low histamine diet. And I've sort of put together all these resources on the website, which is histamineintolerance.net. And yeah, you can cut out the certain foods. That's the main thing. But then you can introduce lots of certain foods that will help lower your histamine levels. The best thing is pea shoots. So I am a huge pea shoot eater. And uh, there's other things like apples and celery as well. Not quite as sort of a little bit healthier than chocolate and red wine, isn't it? Well, my histamine solution might be a bit controversial, but as you know, I'm quite a big nose to tail girl. So I like my organ meat and I found that kidney is actually quite amazing wow. in the long term having regular inclusion of kidney in my meals has been really helpful i don't know if that's something that you found as well for yourself or with your clients i think that's absolutely brilliant and i i have yes grass-fed kidney either in you can use it in supplement form as well and hunter and gather make a good supplement of it and it's not something that's made a huge difference to my histamine bottom line but i know a lot of people love it and i just think that's that's fantastic and i i love the fact that's part of your diet and um yeah that's just fantastic and as you know we're living in portugal now and we one of the things we've struggled with is finding organic meat out here but we're getting we're getting our gaunt or organic game up to scratch so i need to start doing that out here as well you might have to start hunt <laughs> if you can't find it you might yeah. have to hunt it down yourself <laughs> well I mean, that may be what i'm gonna do yeah <laughs> gonna be out there with my bow and arrow <laughs> that's it very ben greenfield <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> oh tony look what i would love for you to just tell us a little bit more about is your quite unique and extraordinary af method can you tell us a little bit more about that and who can join thank you charlotte How yeah I, you join? well you know i sort of wanted to bring together what i do with mindset and what I do with health. And I am now working with clients on the healthy AF method. And I was sort of doing it one-on-one with clients, but I realized a bit like you, that it's not, it's quite time intensive. And I wanted to work with more than one person at once. So it's a, it's a program essentially where you work on healing, optimizing, and then transforming your health with mindset. And that's using the skills of NLP that we've talked around and energy psychology, which is just mind-blowingly good and all sort of linked into the NLP stuff as well. Emotional freedom therapy and, and various things like that in there as well. So that's what I'm doing with people. It's it's really good fun. If people want to find out more about it, it's tonywrighton.com slash healthy. And yeah, if people are sort of going through unexplained health conditions or they're not as healthy as they want to be, or they're a budding biohacker, but they're just not at a hundred percent, this is the, the, the place that nobody thinks is the most important thing to look at, but it is. As we said, it, it might be the, the thing that's hardest to persuade people that they need, but I think the healthy AF method is exactly what they need in terms of using mindset to improve their health. And perhaps if someone is listening and is really curious and is really tempted to go and check it out, but still on the fans, could you share with us a no-name basis success story, something remarkable that's happened as a result of using your method? Oh, Charlene, that's another good question. I've been podcasting for years and you've been doing it about five minutes and you got all the good questions. <laughs> uh, so, yes, actually, thank you. Well, this particular method I launched about a month ago and I've been so thrilled because it's taken me far too long, far too much of my life putting it all together. I thought it was going to be like a few months and I sort it out. I've taken ages putting this thing together, doing the course, recording the videos, everything else. And I actually spoke to on a no-name basis, one lady who's taken the course, she is medically extremely well qualified. So she's not a doctor. She's more senior than that. And she's coming to me to take my course. She's humble enough to admit that when it comes to healing and health, she doesn't know everything. And she said that just over the first couple of weeks of taking the course, she's experienced a huge difference because she's doing things like the floating technique that we were talking about earlier on. She's using NLP techniques like pattern interrupts and logical levels. And it's making a massive difference to the bottom line 
of her health. And she said she, you know, she's even used it at work herself because obviously when you're at a senior level in medicine, things get very stressful very quickly. And we know from all the research that stress leads to histamine issues and histamine issues lead to stress. So that's a, a two way street that she's also battling with. But yeah, so that's it's been really lovely having having the feedback. And I'm sort of getting that feedback because we've got a WhatsApp group for everybody who's in who's in the healthy AF method as well. Tony, I'm so grateful. We've all learned tons from hearing you today. I just wanted to say thank you so much again. I'll include the link to your course in the show notes. Do you want to leave us with one more thought? <laughs> one more nugget. Um, do you know it's really difficult because I, I've mentioned that we're living in Portugal now and I realize that's not advice that you can give everybody. Oh, just move to Portugal. It's going to be okay. <laughs> but the simple things in life, if you can, getting out, maybe going barefoot on the ground for at least a couple of minutes a day, seeing some morning sunlight, going to bed at the same time every night. It's normally less exciting than the exotic biohacks, but they're normally the things that work. And then if you can work on your mindset as well, that can make a radical difference to your health. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Tony. It was wonderful. See you soon. Thank you for spending your time with me today and listening to this episode. Remember to subscribe so that you can receive weekly updates. And if today's message resonated with you, please remember to share it with a friend, a colleague or a loved one who could really benefit from this episode.